Well, after a very wintry week, welcome to our worship for Balshagri Victoria Park Church. Wherever you are, it's good to have you with us at this time on a Sunday, or indeed whenever you watch it. We always begin in prayer, so let's turn now to speak to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you this winter's morning using words uttered by Isaiah the prophet. You have declared what is to come from the distant past. There is no God apart from you, a righteous God and Saviour. You are God, and there is no other. We gather today connecting in these different ways to reflect on your power and might, your mercy and your love, and to offer our worship. We come now to offer you our prayers at this time. We know that you are a God who does not take pleasure in wickedness, who cannot look upon our sins. And so we come to you to open our hearts and say that we are sorry. Forgive us for failing to appreciate everything that you have given. We become over familiar and don't value and understand what you've blessed us with. We focus on the negatives rather than the positives. So Lord, hear our prayers and forgive us for not acting as you would wish us to. We reflect on how we pass over the message of the gospel. We don't see it as we should. It becomes something limiting and restrictive, rather than life-affirming and showing us how to live better. So Lord, hear our prayers and forgive us for our poor attitude. Through your Holy Spirit, teach us to accept life in all its fullness. To celebrate your love in all its richness. And to be able to share with others the joy you have given us in such abundance. Lord God, we know that unless you build the house, the builders labour in vain. So we ask that you will go ahead of us to lead us, to be our companion aside us on the journey, and be behind us to protect us from all harm in our week ahead. So we ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour and Redeemer. Amen. The reading this morning is Psalm 127. 
Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. Well, on these long, dark winter's nights in the midst of lockdown, it's good to be able to settle down in the evenings and watch some good TV to pass the time. We dug out a series that had been on a couple of years ago called Race Across the World. The task was to travel from London to Singapore for the price of an air ticket, but the catch was that the contestants weren't able to fly, they had to use every other means possible to reach their destination. So each week, as we watched the various parts of the journey, we saw boats, trains, taxis, you name it. They were all used to aid the teams as they raced across to reach Singapore first and to claim the prize. The thing was, as they travelled across the various lands and cultures, they realised that although they could have got there much more quickly by taking the aeroplane, they would have missed out on so much. What they gained by travelling by land was seeing the vast range of civilizations that exist across our world and the breathtaking scenery, lost if you fly above the clouds. So although reaching the destination came with a prize, there seemed to be just as much reward in undertaking the journey for itself. Although as Christians we are focused on the destination at eternity and being with Jesus, we're called to live our lives to the full just now. How we live out the journey is important. So keep that in your minds today as we look at the words of this psalm. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. We can go through our lives seeking to reach a particular goal that we've set ourselves and then when we eventually get there, we might question whether it was really all worth the effort. Years of sacrifice in order to obtain some sort of prize and then on achieving it, we look at all the things we might have foregone to win it. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. We all have a life to live, and yet so many of us try to live out these lives without asking the Lord to be in them and to have them through the Holy Spirit blessing us and guiding us. We try to do it ourselves and we set our priorities elsewhere. Now, standing here today, we will all no doubt say as we read these words that we agree, that we will all say we want the Lord to be involved in our lives, and that if this happens, you know, life will be better, it will be more worthy, it will be more akin to what we think would be the best for us. But as we do so, let's think about this. We say that we want the Lord to build the house, but what concept do we have here? And it reminds me of something we looked at when we began this series back at Psalm 120. We want God to be involved, but it's the ordinary God. It's one that doesn't really get involved in our lives and affect us in any real way. And perhaps even then, we don't really want the ordinary God anyway. When we read these verses, it's clear that the Lord we're talking about here is the God we read about in the pages of the Bible. The God that scripture tells us created the world, flung stars into space, and yet, becoming one of us, took on the form of a servant and atoned for our sins through the shedding of his blood on the cross. That is the God we're talking about here, when we read of the things of our lives that will be in vain unless we proactively let this God take control of them. Think of it another way. I was reading this week a basic introduction to John's Gospel and it made a good illustration. If you had problems when you were using Microsoft packages and you phoned the company up, 
you wouldn't expect Bill Gates to answer the phone and say, OK, let me just sort that for you just now. Or if perhaps you phoned up ScotRail to find out when a train was due, you wouldn't expect the First Minister to be answering calls at that level. Or if you phoned up the post office concerned about stamps, you wouldn't expect the Prime Minister to be taking that call either. You might well think, in, well, a person of seniority really would have more important things to worry about. But if we stop and pause and really dwell on these verses, we are asking the God of the Bible to get right into the daily workings of our lives and for the Holy Spirit to move in there. And from that, the outcomes we would get would be so much better because it would be the outcomes that God wants, outcomes with real value. But we have to proactively ask God into our lives. So having said this, let's take a different angle. God isn't just there in our lives. Jesus isn't just there in our lives. We have to ask him to be present. When we pray, we have to mean it. So if we take a different text, and it's one we know about the wedding in Cana. When we open John's Gospel, we read about the magnitude of Jesus, the Son of God, the Saviour of the world. When he sees Jesus, John states that he is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. By becoming fully man, we are able to some small, limited extent, glimpse the glory of God the Father through Jesus. And that is us trying to understand the majesty of Jesus and his redeeming purpose in our world, coming to us to save sinners. So why then, when we turn to the next chapter, do we read about Jesus being at a wedding? Does Jesus, to take the point I made a minute ago, not have more important things to worry about in the world and to be doing than to be at a wedding? And the answer is quite simple. When we read John chapter 2, we read that Jesus was at the wedding because he was invited. Jesus was involved with the everyday lives of the people round about him. And that can be a good thought to have to reassure us that God really wants us to know Jesus for ourselves, to see him as saviour, to have him at the centre of our lives, not just at the periphery or one part of how we live, competing with everything else. But he was there because he was invited. Invitation here is crucial. So if we turn back to Psalm 127 for a moment, we find that it's considered that this psalm actually wasn't probably written by David, as we think most of them were, but actually by Solomon. And the thing here to think of when we think about that is some other words that Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, because it begins with the statement that everything in life is meaningless, utterly meaningless. And it follows with this question. What does man gain from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? It's all meaningless. Then put those thoughts up against what's written, probably by Solomon, here. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labour in vain. The presumption is actually that the Lord does indeed build the house. And if God is involved in our lives, then he grants sleep to those he loves. So to draw our thoughts together for this morning, let's go back to that picture I gave, if you like, the image of phoning Microsoft and Bill Gates answering the phone. I don't know about you, but for me, I'm lucky if I just get a human being to answer the phone when I call. It's usually an automated message. But if we call God to be part of our lives, if we invite Jesus just as he was invited to that wedding in Galilee, Jesus will be part of your lives and Jesus will give our lives the meaning that we so desperately seek. And we get that statement probably from Solomon in contrast to what he wrote in Ecclesiastes that life is just meaningless. It has no great purpose whatsoever unless we allow the Lord 
to build the house. We may always have thought of eternity as being something away on the horizon. That point when we'll be with Jesus, our Saviour. But we still have to live our lives now. And we're called to live them to the full with meaning. So in the quest to get to the destination, seek that the Lord will always aid you to get the most out of the journey. of all. You have made us in your image, each one the work of your hands. We are all precious in your sight, so we praise you for it. Yet as we turn to you in prayer, we recall how across the years, and stagly still nowadays too, so many suffer in our world. We pray for those near to us, our families, those we love, and people we know of who need your blessing at this time. So we name them to you now. And we pray for those around us in society, those struggling at this time through being overloaded at work. And we pray for those without work, perhaps lost through the events of this past year. Lord, may they experience a sense of your love to strengthen them at this time. We think too of those who are ill. We think in particular of those finding these current restrictions just too much, 
They're always caught up with the events that are out with their control. They're always feeling crammed in, with nowhere to go to experience a sense of calm or serenity. Lord, reach out in love to them. And now we look at our world. Those in far off lands and continents. The poor. The hungry. The dispossessed. We think of those who suffer purely because of their beliefs. And those forced from their own lands as refugees. Lord, we often sense we can do little, but we pray that you would move mightily in these lands too. And so today, Almighty God, we pray that you would give strength and courage to all who are powerless, and that our world would work for a better future. So give strength to those who work for freedom and peace and a just world. Lord of all and Lord of love, we ask these prayers in your name. Well, it's been good to have you with us this morning. And so, wherever you are, may the grace, mercy and peace of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you at this time and evermore. Amen.